In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us once again a beautiful day. The opportunity once again to gather together as one family, though we are in different parts of the world, in different time zones. Yet, O oh Lord, you have made this possible for each one of us. Thank you, Spirit of God for this great opportunity you give us each day to hear your voice, to listen to your word and to be taught by the Holy Spirit. This morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever we are, Spirit of God, take complete control of this entire class. As I speak the word, nothing of me, everything of you, anoint my heart and lips so that this words that I speak will be the anointed words of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may all my brothers and sisters and all of us who are hearing your word be truly be blessed by understanding these truths and applying in our day-to-day -day life so that we can receive the victory that Jesus won for us. We thank you and praise you, Father, for all this. In Jesus' name, amen. So brothers and sisters, once again, we are on the Gospel of John and today we are going to reflect on John chapter 19 verses 25 to 34. And we must understand in verse in chapter 19, this is the chapter which describes the crucifixion of Jesus. And we are going to take the Gospel in the final moments of Jesus before he passes away from this world. We must understand brothers and sisters that Jesus went through the garden of Gethsemane. He was arrested by the chief priests, the scribes who came because Judas, one of the disciples betrayed Jesus. He knew the place where Jesus was. They picked up Jesus from the Kidron Valley and they crucified him. And here we are in the moments when Jesus is hanging on that cross. There are only a few moments left for him to pass away from this life. And we must understand, brothers and sisters, whenever someone is passing away from this world or someone is going to be handing over authority or someone is going to, you know, resign from their jobs. The last words that somebody speaks are always very important. Everybody always latches on to those last words that are spoken. And in today's gospel, we are actually going to hear Jesus speaking the last words before he went to his father. So let's hear this in verse number 25. And this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now here we read, this is what the soldiers did. What did they do, brothers and sisters? We need to read before verse number 25, what actually the soldiers did. There was a prophecy that Jesus' clothes would be divided. That the soldiers would actually put dice for the clothes of Jesus. So after the four soldiers that were there, put dice for four pieces of Jesus' cloth, there was one particular item of Jesus which they could not divide among themselves. So they cast lots for Jesus' garment. And you know, brothers and sisters, what actually happened even regarding Jesus' clothes, which were divided between the four soldiers, has been written down in scriptures. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, Everything that took place in the life of Jesus on this earth was already recorded in scriptures. The prophets had already written that well in advance so many centuries before. 
Now, first and foremost, there were four soldiers that were looking after or supervising this crucifixion. How do we know? Because four soldiers had to take care of one man. The one man, Jesus, four soldiers were assigned to carry out this crucifixion. And these four soldiers were putting dice for the clothes of Jesus. And where do we read that? In Psalm 22, verse number 18. Let's read that and see what was written and what the soldiers really did. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing, they cast lots. They cast lots for the clothing of Jesus. And what was the lot that was cast? For one of his garments, which they could not divide among themselves. But they actually divided his clothing among four soldiers. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we go to the Psalm 22, if we really reflect on Psalm 22, Psalm 22 is a very prophetic psalm. It actually tells us, when, as we go through that, everything that was written in Psalm 22 actually happened on the cross, actually happened during the crucifixion, actually happened right through Jesus' arrest, right up to his death. Every single thing that happened has been recorded in Psalm 22. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we look at Psalm 22 and what actually happened, we come to this conclusion that how scripture is so important, how scriptures have to come to pass in our lives when we believe those scriptures. There was a prophecy that was written about Jesus so many centuries before, and now it is being fulfilled at the cross. It is being fulfilled in the garden of, uh, at, 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 at the Calvary. And brothers and sisters, when we understand that at that cross, along with Jesus being crucified, there were three Marys who were present. One is Mary, the mother of Jesus. One is Mary Magdalene. And one is Mary, who was also the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we reflect, on these three Marys who were present at the crucifixion. There is one particular truth that we come to realize that these women were absolutely bold. They were fearless, they were courageous. And most importantly, they knew whom they were following. They had a very good understanding of who really Jesus was. And they were ready to risk their lives, so to say, in order to follow Jesus right to the crucifixion. When we understand, brothers and sisters, that Jesus' own disciples, whom he ate and lived and taught for three and a half years, deserted him and ran away, and we realize these three women, the three Marys, were there at the cross. And there was one of those disciples who was there to record it, unlike the other 11. And that was John. He is the only disciple who was present there at the crucifixion. And this speaks a lot of John and these women who accompanied Jesus right to his crucifixion on the cross. For example, Mary Magdalene was the woman from whom seven demons were cast. And you know, brothers and sisters, when Mary Magdalene was set free by Jesus, she became a disciple of Jesus. And if we read further, which we have already reflected in the resurrection, Mary Magdalene had the privilege to be the first person to witness the resurrection of Jesus. Then we had the mother of Jesus. She was a woman of such faith. She was the one who said to the Lord or to angel Gabriel, let it be done to me according to your word. And this was Jesus who was conceived in a womb. And now she is there present when her son is breathing his last. Then there is Mary, who is a sister of Mary, of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And who is she? 
she is the wife of Cleopas, who was one of the disciples who on the road to Emmaus. So he was the uncle of Jesus. And his son, this Mary and Cleopas' son, was James, who was also a disciple of Jesus. So brothers and sisters, when we look at all these men and women, especially John and the women who were there at the cross, it speaks a lot about them, how convinced they were, who really Jesus was, and who, who really Jesus was to them. Because they did not worry about their lives. They did not even care what people would say about them, how they would be able to walk that journey with Jesus. But the very fact that they had experienced something from Jesus in their lives, they were ready to follow him right to the cross of Calvary. Verse number 26 and 27 together. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. You know, brothers and sisters, when we read these two verses in 26 and 27, personally, I'm so inspired. In fact, it is one of the classic or most beautiful examples of a selfless Jesus. You know, here is Jesus himself going through extreme suffering. He's going through extreme pain. He has gone through extreme torture. He is hanging on that cross, literally trying to breathe air because when you are crucified, brothers and sisters, a person who's crucified, it becomes extremely difficult for anyone who's crucified in order to even breathe. It becomes extremely difficult. And here is Jesus in the last hours of his life. He is more interested in his mother, who is more interested in so many other people. What does he tell John? He says, John, this is your mother. He tells John, he tells his mother, this is your son. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we understand how we need to honor our parents, Jesus was actually fulfilling that scripture when he was honoring his mother, Mary. He was looking after a need even after he was going to pass away from this world. He was interested to see that Mary, his mother, was in safe hands. And he gives this Mary, his mother, into the hands of John. Because Jesus, after he died and rose again, he no longer walked in the flesh. But he now walked in a resurrected body. And so he could not in the flesh look after his mother Mary and he has entrusted now at the cross his mother to John, a disciple whom he loved. And so brothers and sisters, when we read in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2, we read how children need to honor their parents. Let's read that. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 2. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So brothers and sisters, here Jesus is honoring his mother. He is truly looking after her need. What was Jesus' purpose? To come on this earth and to die for the sins of the whole world. That was God's plan for him. He fulfills that plan. He has done his work. And now he's going back to the father. But in spite of being in agony, in spite of being in pain, in spite of suffering such grievous pain, he still is selfless, focusing on his mother, focusing on her provisions, focusing on that future that she still has to be on this earth. And he looks after her by focusing on John and giving him the responsibility to look after his mother. Verse number 28. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. 
I am thirsty. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus was purposely fulfilling every scripture that was written about him. As I mentioned to you earlier in Psalm 22, everything that is written in Psalm 22 was very prophetic. Everything that Jesus did came to pass. And even in Psalm 69, verse number 21, it talks about this particular thing about Jesus thirsting. Psalm 22, verse, verse 15. Let's read that. My mouth is dried up like a pot shell. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. So look at this brothers and sisters. Jesus is going through such terrible pain. There's been nothing given to him to drink except vinegar mixed with myrrh. He's gone through all that torture. And at this time, in order to fulfill scriptures, he opens his mouth and says, I am thirsty. Let us see what it says in Psalm 69, verse number 21. They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, Jesus is in agony on the cross. And anyone who's going through agony, somebody who's got a heart, somebody who's got compassion, would reach out and try to alleviate their pain. But look at the heartlessness of these people. They are ready to give him vinegar mixed with myrrh. They, the hatred for Jesus is so profound that they do not want to show any compassion to Jesus. And John, who is there at the last moments, along with Alvin, he records whatever he can get. You must understand, brothers and sisters, so much was going on at the cross. So many people speaking, so many people wailing and crying, especially the women, his mother. Even John must have been in quite sorrow to see his master going through that agony, that it was impossible for John to record everything. And brothers and sisters, when we understand that when we read John, Matthew, Mark and Luke together, we get the whole picture of what really happened at the cross. Because even though John was there present at the cross, he has not recorded everything. He has failed to pick up all the little things which other gospel writers have picked up. And so when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and put the whole story together and what happened to the cross, we get the complete picture what happened at the cross of Calvary and we can appreciate the agony, the pain, the suffering, the drama, the, 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 the hatred that those people had towards Jesus and how Jesus was able to endure everything at the cross. Let us take this one scripture, for example, in Luke chapter 23 verses 39 to 43. It's only Luke who's written about the, the thieves one on the right and one on the left. Let's read that in Luke 23, 39 to 43. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept, de kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong then he said Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom he replied truly I tell you Today, you will be with me in paradise. So as we read in Luke chapter 23, 39 to 43, we see there that it was only Luke who recorded about the two thieves who were, who were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. You don't find that recorded by John, although John was present there at the, at the crucifixion. And there is another one where we read only recorded by Luke in Luke chapter 23, verse number 46. These are the words of Jesus just before he died. Let's read that. 
Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So brothers and sisters, we can see that as we read all the synoptic gospels, every synoptic gospel by itself does not cover everything that happened at the cross of Calvary. If we see what John has written, we find Luke has missed. If we find what Luke has written, John has written, Luke has missed or the other way. But when we read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we realize what exactly happened when we read all of them together and we get the full story. For example, let us see what happened exactly at the cross. What are the words that Jesus said at the cross? Let's begin with Matthew chapter 27, verse number 46. We don't find that written by John. We don't find that recorded by the other disciples, by the other synoptic gospel writers. Only Matthew records that. Let's read it. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here it is three o'clock. It is the time which we know Jesus gave up his spirit. He calls out to his father, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know, although John was present there, I'm sure, brothers and sisters, there must have been so much of activity at the cross. There must have been so many things happening at the foot of the cross while Jesus was breathing his last, that it, is, it was not possible or John missed out on those details. But we know what Jesus uttered at the last time before passing out of this life. John 19, 26 to 27, we just read that. He talks about taking care of his mother. He instructs his disciple John to take care of his mother. John 19 verse number 28, which we have just been reflecting. He talks about he thirsting. Then Luke 23 verse 46. We just know what he said. He said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. And let us read that, what Jesus says in Luke 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So brothers and sisters, when we understand that when Jesus was about to pass away from this life, he had uttered a few words. And what did he say? Into your hands, I commend my spirit. And you know, brothers and sisters, that was, as I said to you, it was impossible for John to record everything. There must have been so many people saying so many things. There might have been Jesus wanted to try to say some words because of all the noise because of all the screaming and yelling i'm sure the women must have been crying there must have been such a scene of agony there not only for jesus but his own mother his mother's sister mary magdalene they were seeing jesus in agony and you could have imagined the scene just minutes or seconds before jesus gave up his ghost that brothers and sisters <laughs> There must have been so many things that Jesus was uttering, but it was not all recorded by John. But when we read all the synoptic gospels, when we actually ask the Holy Spirit to give us an understanding what really happened, we begin to appreciate, we begin to understand the cost that Jesus paid for you and me on that cross. The agony that he went, brothers and sisters, Jesus died our death. There was no need of Jesus to go on the cross. He had committed no sin. And that is why, brothers and sisters, when the sinless son of God went on the cross, the devil used people to torture the son of God without sin. This was illegal for the devil to do because God would never do it to his son. But the devil had the audacity 
to use people whom he had still control over because we must understand brothers and sisters until Jesus died on the cross until Jesus died on the cross Satan was the ruler on this earth the whole earth and everyone on it belonged to Satan and so whatever Satan did on this earth by touching the son of God by touching the sinless son of God he had done it illegally and this is where he lost his battle against God God as man snatched back the authority from Satan which was given by Adam at the, at the Garden of Eden and now as man Jesus has given that authority to you and me and not only on this earth brothers and sisters as we reflected today or yesterday but he has given us authority over Satan over the powers of the hell authority on earth and even we can bind things in heaven according to Matthew 18 verse 19 so brothers and sisters when we think of what Jesus has done for us on that cross of Calvary when we understand those moments before Jesus passed from this life as man the suffering and the agony that he went we can only bow our heads in worship in total worship brothers and sisters to a God who loved us till the end a God who gave himself completely to us a God who died our death verse number 29 a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of his sup and held it to his mouth. Now here we read that when Jesus was thirsty, what do you think someone who has got a heart, someone who's got compassion would do? They would definitely want to do something to alleviate the pain, alleviate the suffering of that person. And what do these people do? They take some cheap wine with a hyssop and they stick it up to the mouth of Jesus. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we read verse number 29, it was not the only time that Jesus was offered cheap vinegar. If we read Mark chapter 15, verse 23, and Luke 23, verse 36, Jesus was offered cheap vinegar even after Golgotha right up to the cross. Before that, this is the second time he's offered cheap wine. Let us read that in Mark chapter 15 verse 23. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. So Jesus was offered a cheap wine while he was on the cross holding the cross all the way to calvary and what was mixed in it brothers and sisters myrrh myrrh is not something that is consumed by anybody myrrh is a poison it is it is not to be consumed by human beings and they actually decided to put that in the cheap wine and offered it to jesus when he was thirsty, when he needed some consolation, when he needed some comfort. And brothers and sisters, the first time when Jesus was offered cheap wine in Mark 15, 23, he refused it. But the second time, because it was written, because this is the time Jesus opened his mouth to bring scriptures to pass, they actually put it on a hyssop and they gave it to Jesus you know brothers and sisters again I would like to stress every scripture that was written about Jesus Jesus ensured that everything that was written about him came to pass and if you and I can understand that everything that is written in the Word of God when we believe it it will surely come to pass in your life and in my life and therefore it is so important for us to believe the word of God to believe the message of Jesus to respond to those words of Jesus and proving to him that we truly love him verse number 30 when Jesus had received the wine he said 
it is finished then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit so brothers and sisters in verse number 30 we read that jesus uttered these words it is finished and only when he opened his mouth and said it is finished only then he gave up his spirit we must understand brothers and sisters verse number 19 in order to understand verse number 19 we need to read what the book of daniel says in daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 26 because daniel had actually written all that jesus was to go through he was a prophet he had written what this word finished would really mean what was the reason there was sin that was accounted in our favor because of the law so let us read daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 26. 70 weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression to put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint a most holy place know therefore and understand from the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild jerusalem until the time of an anointed prince there shall be seven weeks and for 62 weeks it shall be built again with streets and moat but in a troubled time so here verse number go ahead verse number 26 after the 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing and the troops of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war desolations are decreed so brothers and sisters when we read the book of daniel don't really go much into those 62 weeks there is so much to it to be explained but it is talking about jesus the anointed one who would go through and he would blot out every ordinance against us and nail it to the cross. You know, brothers and sisters, in the old covenant, the blood of bulls and goats used to be used in order as a sacrifice in order to cover up sin. It could never deal with the root of sin. But the day Jesus died, the spotless lamb of God, he blotted out every ordinance. He blotted out everything that was, that was against us and nailed it on the cross. And because of what Jesus did, you and I who believe in him are now sons and daughters of the heavenly father. And St. Paul writing to the Colossians in chapter 2 verse 14, he says it so beautifully. Let us read that, how he explains what happened when Jesus said it is finished? When Jesus said, when Jesus said it is finished and Jesus completed that sacrifice on the cross. Erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. So when Jesus went to the cross, offered himself as a living sacrifice he died for our sins you know brothers and sisters he made the old covenant obsolete the law was completely finished and jesus introduced the law of faith he introduced the new covenant that was sealed in his precious blood and that's exactly what we read in hebrews chapter 8 verses 7 to 10 it says if the old covenant was good enough there would have been no need of a new covenant but jesus 
is the author of that new covenant. Jesus is the one who brought man and God together through the sacrifice of his blood on the cross. Let us read that in Hebrews 8, 7 to 10. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with your ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. For they do not continue in my covenant. And so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. It says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. You know, brothers and sisters, it is only through that precious blood of Jesus which was shed on the cross. When we believe in that sacrifice of Jesus, that you and I today, right now, are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. We are sons and daughters of God himself. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And that is why, brothers and sisters, when Jesus said it is finished, all those living at that time, or all those who would be living and who would come on this planet Earth, believing in that sacrifice of Jesus, would receive the sonship and daughterhood when they believed in that sacrifice of Jesus. Now, let me say this to you. When Jesus said it is finished, the, the, the covenant was not completed. The complete package of salvation was not completed. Why? Because Jesus had still not gone and preached to those souls which had died before he went to the cross. We must remember, brothers and sisters, right from Adam till the time Jesus died, all those Old Testament saints had still not been set free. And therefore, they had to be preached the gospel. They had to be told that there was a blood, not of goats and bulls that was shed, but the blood of the Son of God. And so what happens? Jesus goes and preaches to those souls. We read that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. Let's read that. In which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. So brothers and sisters, we must understand when Jesus died on this earth and he said it is finished, everyone who was living at that time and everyone like us who has been living on this earth, who believes in that sacrifice of Jesus is saved and becomes a son and a daughter. But everyone who died before Jesus came did not have the opportunity to believe in Jesus, did not have the opportunity to believe in that sacrifice of Jesus. So what happens? Jesus, when he died, because he was made sin, he got access to the place where all the Old Testament saints were waiting in order to receive salvation. And so brothers and sisters, when Jesus died, he went to the souls and he preached to them. And when he preached to them and had finished setting them free, 
he returned back to earth and that is the time he was now in the new resurrected body and you know brothers and sisters when we read in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9 what Saint Paul is saying Saint Paul is actually talking to us about exactly what Jesus did about descending to the to the, to the bottom and then ascending to the top let's read that in Ephesians 4 8 to 9 therefore it is said when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. So he descended to the lower parts of the earth. You know, brothers and sisters, the Old Testament talked about the lower parts of the earth as Sheol, the place where people went after they died. And here, Jesus gets access to that place only because he has been made sin for the whole world. That's exactly what we read and we reflected on in the last few weeks. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. He who knew no sin was made sin for the whole world. And so Jesus could get access to that place only because he was made sin. But brothers and sisters, he had not committed any sin. He had only borne our sins. And so the punishment for that sin, he already bore. And when he went there, he took off that coat of sin and he preached to the souls there who were waiting for salvation and he set them free. Brothers and sisters, you can imagine the brilliance of God, the brilliant plan of God of salvation. Not only was he able to save the people here on earth, but he was also able to save the people who did not, who were not present before he came on the earth and he performed the sacrifice for their sins as well. And so when we look at that, brothers and sisters, we understand now that Jesus has been raised from the dead. He has ascended to the Father. What is he doing for us? He is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for each one of us who live on this present earth. Remember, brothers and sisters, we have an intercessor before the throne of God. And that is Jesus Christ himself. The most and only best intercessor that we can have near, at near the throne of God is Christ himself. Who became weak like us and understands how weak we can be. And yet he's making intercessions for us according to Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Let us read that. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. So brothers and sisters, Jesus lives to make intercession for whom? Do you think that Jesus is interceding for the people who have already passed from this life? Absolutely not. Because the people who have passed out from this life, they are already, if they were in Christ, they are sleeping in Christ. Remember, brothers and sisters, we must understand that everyone who passes out of this life, whether it is in Christ or not in Christ, they are sleeping. And right now, they are not able to experience the presence of God because Jesus has still not come for the judgment. When he comes the second time as the righteous judge, he will raise those who are sleeping in Christ first. And we have already read that in the book of Thessalonians, that they will be resurrected first and they'll meet the Lord in the sky. And all those who are present at that time when he comes again, they will be supernaturally also lifted up with Christ in the new body and they will all be in the new place in the new resurrected body 
And brothers and sisters, when we understand this, that there is only one intercessor at the throne of God and Jesus Christ himself, we have his living word. We have his promise. We have the Holy Spirit with us. We can go and approach the throne of grace and receive grace because the one whom we believe is continuously interceding for us so that we can receive everything that he has finished for you and me on the cross. Verse number 31. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a great, was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Now here we see in verse number 31 that the, that the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two thieves who were on either side of Jesus. We must understand brothers and sisters that a person who's crucified on the cross is actually suffocating and breathless, struggling to breathe. And you know what happens? If you really think what happens when a person is hanging on the cross, they actually start lifting up their legs in order to allow their lungs to take in fresh air. And the moment they were, their legs were broken, that ability to raise their body and to take air is stopped. And as a result, the person dies of suffocation. So breaking of the legs only hastened death. Breaking of the legs hastened their dying of suffocation. And you can imagine, brothers and sisters, when the, when the soldiers had come to Jesus, they found him already dead. He had already given up his spirit. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, the sinless son of God who committed no sin, he went through a torturous death which you and I would normally have to go through because of our sins. But because of his love for us, Jesus went on the cross, was tortured for that price that he had to pay for our sins. And we can only stand in awe. We can bow down and worship to this God and thank him for what he has done for us. And you know, brothers and sisters, in Psalm 22 and Psalm 69, everything that was written about Jesus came to pass. Every scripture that was written in detail of what Jesus would go through on the cross actually manifested at Calvary. Verse number 32 and 33. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So the, 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 the soldiers had already made a plan that they would break the legs of Jesus and the two thieves. So when they came to the two thieves, they already found that they were still alive. And what did they do? They actually broke their legs and hastened death, as I just explained. But when it came to Jesus, Jesus had already passed away. He, Jesus had actually given up his spirit. Remember, brothers and sisters, if you read carefully in John 10, 18, in John 10, 18, it is written that Jesus said, I give up my life to take it back. Let's read that in John chapter 10 verse 18 and see how scriptures are truly fulfilled. How when Jesus speaks a word, those words actually come to pass. No one takes it from me, but I lay down on my own accord. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. 
So when we read this, brothers and sisters, Jesus had already prophesied that even though the devil was going to torture him, the soldiers were going to be used by the devil to give Jesus such a hard time on the cross. Jesus would not be killed by the soldiers, even though he was hanging on that cross. But it was Jesus who gave up his spirit. That's what we read in John chapter 19, verse 30. Let's read that. John 19, verse 30. In John 19, verse 30, when Jesus said, it is finished, he gave up his spirit and he said, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, when we understand Jesus did not die because the because the devil or because of suffocation. Jesus went through that agony. He stayed there on the cross. He waited till every prophetic scripture about him was fulfilled. And after everything was fulfilled, he used these words by saying, it is finished. And then he gave up his spirit to the father. He says, father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, when we understand when you are in Christ, the devil cannot touch you. The devil cannot destroy your life. He has got no power to kill you because he has already been defeated. Let me say this again. I need to dwell on this for a few moments. Many a times when people die young or they die of sickness, they always say, Lord, why did you take this person away? Lord, why did this person get the sickness? Why is that this person died? Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if anyone is in Christ, God is not the one who is the author of death. God is not the one who has killed that person. It is the devil that has killed that person because that person has failed to fight the good fight of faith. So if you are in Christ, does it mean that you will live for all eternity on this planet Earth? No, by all means, no. But a time will come in your life when you have truly been with Christ and fulfilled everything that you have been told to do by Christ, you will have a desire in order to go back to the Lord, you will say to the Lord, Lord, it's time for me to give up my spirit. And this is the time that your spirit will be actually getting out of your body. But if you have died young or you, if you have died of any sickness, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if anyone has died, it is not the Lord who has killed that person because God is not the author of death. God is the author of life. And if that person has died young of any sickness, it is because that person has not known the truth. That person has failed to believe the word of God, has failed to fight the good fight of faith. And so he has given an access to the devil to kill, steal and destroy. When we understand from Jesus' example that Jesus did not die on the cross, but he himself gave up his spirit. He himself commended his spirit to the Lord. And we can take this example and understand that only, only when I desire, by when the Holy Spirit in me tells me, your innings are over. You have finished the good fight of faith. You have completed your race. You have now ready to go so that you can hand over the baton to somebody else. This is the time you and I will give up our spirit in order to receive the higher life. Brothers and sisters, let this truth go into our mind that it is not God who is the author of death, but it is Satan who is the author of death. And so we must fight the good fight of faith. And every moment that we live on this planet Earth, let us use it in order to bring glory to our God in order to fulfill that mission for which he has put us on this earth. If all that we want to live on this planet earth is for our self pleasure, for our own goal, for our own dreams, for our own desires, then surely we are not going to be connected with the Lord. We will open ourselves to the wiles of the enemy and he will kill, 
steal and destroy verse number 34 instead one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out you know brothers and sisters to understand the significance of verse number 34 we must understand what the human body is all made up of in fact the heart of every single person is enclosed in a, in, in a case of liquid it's called as a pericardium i actually went and researched this it's called as a pericardium and it is a case which is filled with liquid that looks like you know it's more looking like water but it is a liquid in which the heart is encased so when jesus died the soldiers pierced his pericardium with the spear touching his heart and when the pericardium was broken that liquid spilled out and because of the wound the blood as well spilled out and so brothers and sisters when we understand that jesus died on the cross not his death but he died your death and my death we can only bow down in worship we can pay homage to him every single moment of our life for what he did for us he took our sins he paid for us all and he opened heaven for us let us today with grateful hearts come before our lord not just before his picture not just before a statue or some particular image that is there of christ but let us come to his word and let us make this resolve to obey his word to believe his word and to prove to him that we really love him that we truly honor him let us pray heavenly father thank you so much for the gift of your son jesus thank you jesus for leaving your glory above coming here to this earth and dying our death for paying the price for all our sins and opening heaven for us lord jesus as we reflect on all that happened at calvary as we reflect lord the price that we paid in order to set us free we resolve today to live our life every single moment for you our life belongs to you lord jesus and we make this resolve that from this day onwards our life will be dominated will be controlled by hope and holy spirit living in us we thank you for giving us this understanding of your word thank you for filling us with your grace and your mercy and helping us to live this life for you and you alone we thank you father for all this in the glorious name of jesus amen